Tonight, the dangerous winter storms hitting much of the nation. A coast-to-coast -coast ice out, blinding snow and dangerous ice across the south. Highways frozen solid. The fiery multiple car pileup in Oklahoma. In Texas, a thousand accidents there alone. All of Texas is facing a extremely dangerous winter storm. In Mississippi, this car flips and catches fire. Outrage and vindication. Both sides blasting the other after President Trump's acquittal and the Republicans who voted to convict now under fire as the former president plots his next move. The Trump movement is alive and well. New cases plummeting, COVID reaching the lowest levels we've seen in months. What's behind the plunge? And the new vaccination milestone, two million doses given in just one day. Life on the other side. How should you live your life once fully vaccinated? We asked the experts how they plan to behave. Can you hug your grandkids? Under fire, the host of one of the longest running primetime shows, Stepping Aside, the controversy over racism and The Bachelor. Plus, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle announce another baby is on the way. What it means for their lives outside the royal family. This is NBC Nightly News with Kate Snow. Good evening, I'm Jose diaz Ballard in for Kate Snow. Tonight, 110 million Americans are in the path of severe winter storm systems. Take a look at this map, the deep freeze, snow and ice impacting states coast to coast. It was chaos on the roads today. The worst so far was this fiery pileup outside Oklahoma City. In Texas, the snow came down fast, but the bigger danger was the ice. This 18-wheeler jackknifing on icy roads near Austin. As the storm marches north and east, a deep freeze is coming with it. Dallas is going to hit six degrees. Kathy Park is covering it all for us tonight. Tonight, punishing winter weather stretching across the country, from Oregon to Mississippi. This fiery scene in Jackson being blamed on freezing rain on an icy interstate. In Oklahoma, dangerous roads cause a chain reaction crash. Widespread snow and ice making a mess in Texas as the state braces for an historic blow. All of Texas is facing a extremely dangerous winter storm in the coming days. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Slick slow conditions down. sent 18 wheelers off the freeway and wrecks began piling up. The state reporting at least 1,000 accidents and 10 deaths. The damaging ice storm coating cars, sidewalks, and this entire basketball court. Got the palms wrapped. Backyards frozen over too. The extreme weather also taking aim at Arizona. The heavy snow no match for motorists. Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, and Tennessee all under winter weather alerts. Record-breaking snow in parts of the Pacific Northwest buried streets. Seattle hit with nearly nine inches of snow. It's bad. Don't, don't come out. A big cleanup for crews, but perfect conditions for winter sports. The storm now advancing, threatening 44 states with even more ice and Arctic air. It's so cold in New York's Lake Erie, a thick layer of ice coats everything in sight. Temperatures are falling so fast, some cities haven't been this cold in 100 years. And Kathy joins us live from Central Park. Kathy, this storm is going to have a big impact on the Northeast as well. Jose, it will. Ice accumulation is a big concern here in the Northeast Monday night into Tuesday, which could create even more slick spots on top of the winter mess left behind from the last storm. Some spots could see up to a half an inch of ice, which could lead to widespread power outages. Jose. Kathy Park in New York. Thank you. The fallout today from the acquittal of former President Trump was fierce. One side declaring vindication, the other outraged. And President Biden is now weighing in. Kelly O'Donnell is at the White House. After a second Trump acquittal, tonight Democrats are rendering their own verdict. It was by far the most bipartisan decision and a complete repudiation of the president's conduct. Mr. Rounds, not guilty. House managers did persuade a majority of senators. All 50 Democrats plus seven Republicans voted guilty. Democrats confident in what they presented, but frustrated. We didn't need more witnesses. We need more senators with spines. 
Today, no regrets from the seven Senate Republicans who voted to convict. Three were just reelected themselves to six-year terms, giving them a political buffer. Louisiana Republican Bill Cassidy predicts his vote to convict will gain support over time. I'm attempting to hold President Trump accountable, and that is the trust I have from the people that elected me. Of the seven, only Alaska's Lisa Murkowski faces re-election next year. Today, in a withering new statement, Murkowski said that Mr. Trump swore an oath to defend America and all that we hold sacred. He failed to uphold that oath. Late Saturday night, President Biden released a statement where he seized on GOP leader Mitch McConnell's own words, rebuking Mr. Trump's conduct as a disgraceful dereliction of duty. Reaching across party to assess Mr. Trump the same way as practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. And Kelly, President Biden is trying to move past the impeachment. Well, Jose, this coming week, he will be making his first official trips as president, being sworn in just a month ago, heading to Wisconsin for a televised town hall, and then Michigan to visit a Pfizer vaccine plant, a chance to reclaim some of the spotlight. Jose? Kelly O'Donnell at the White House. Thank you. There are growing questions tonight about what former President Trump will do now that he was once again acquitted. His allies claim he'll retain his position atop the Republican Party, but his legal troubles are far from over. Here's Jeff Bennett. Former President Donald Trump emboldened after escaping Senate conviction. His allies arguing his acquittal only cements his central role within the GOP. The Trump movement is alive and well. All I can say is that the most potent force in the Republican Party is President Trump. Trump hinting at what's on the horizon. In the months ahead, I have much to share with you, and I look forward to continuing our incredible journey together. He's sitting on a roughly $30 million war chest, according to federal campaign filings, which he could use to back primary challenges by candidates he supports, as the Republican Party spirals into an internal fight over its future direction. But uncertainty looms over nearly every aspect of Trump's post-impeachment life. From his political future to the possibility he could face criminal charges now without the legal protections afforded sitting presidents. Prosecutors in Georgia announcing a new investigation into his attempts to overturn the state's 2020 election results. Something occurred here within my jurisdiction that um, may be criminal and if that is the case it needed to be investigated. In New York, prosecutors are probing financial dealings around some of Trump's best-known Manhattan properties, according to the Wall Street Journal. Scrutinizing loans he took out on Trump Tower and Trump International Hotel, among others. The Trump Organization did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. And then there's the possibility Trump could still face consequences for inciting the deadly Capitol insurrection, as suggested by Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell. We have a criminal justice system in this country. We have civil litigation, and former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. And Jeff joins us now from Washington. Jeff, Senator Lindsey Graham says he's headed to Florida to meet with Trump. That's right, and he says he's going to encourage Trump to work with Republicans to ensure they win back the House and Senate in 2022. But even those Republicans who are eager to move on from Trump, they're still grappling with the fact that he's still very popular among the party's base. Jose? Jeff Bennett in Washington, thank you. We have some good news in the fight against COVID. The number of daily new cases is dropping dramatically, now just a third of what it was just a month ago. And we hit a new record high for vaccinations in a single day. These are the reasons for optimism, but as Megan Fitzgerald reports, there's also a reason for caution. Tonight, vaccinations are on the rise. I'm really excited to be getting the second dose. On Friday, a single day record of more than 2 million shots. As of yesterday, we hit the 50 million vaccinations into arms. The nation is trending in the right direction. Take a look at this chart from the CDC that shows daily case totals are falling from over 300,000 in January to fewer than 100,000 now. Hospitalizations have dropped by nearly half in the last month. While progress is steady, so are the issues. The nation's largest vaccination site at Dodger Stadium still empty. 
They ran out of vials three days ago. That is unacceptable. I want to be clear. Los Angeles needs more doses. The dose shortage impacting four other L.A. locations now temporarily closed, too. And the weather. Snow and ice storms are forcing mass vaccination sites to close from Oregon to Texas and into the Northeast. And the threat of more contagious variants remains. So far, over a thousand cases detected in more than 39 states, including the South African strain that reinfected a patient in France. It's the first known case. Which tells us that prior infection does not protect you against reinfection, at least with this particular variant. And news the UK strain could be deadlier, according to new research out of Britain. That means we're likely to have more cases and more deaths from this. We can't let our guard down. We, we have to continue wearing masks. This comes as states are easing restrictions from coast to coast, some even lifting mask mandates. Montana is the latest. We need to get um, our communities uh, back to some um, normal functioning before we can start thinking about letting up our mitigation strategies. And Megan joins us from Los Angeles. Megan, when will cities like Los Angeles get more vaccine? Jose, it's day to day. City officials here in L.A. say they have been able to secure enough of the vaccine to reopen Dodger Stadium on Tuesday, but they're only able to offer second doses. Jose. Megan Fitzgerald in Los Angeles. Thank you. And there's some happy news today for two British royal transplants now making their home here in the U.S. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are expecting their second child. Sarah Harmon is in London with more. It's another royal baby for Prince Harry and Meghan. The couple confirming they're expecting their second child. Sharing this photo and writing, we can confirm that Archie is going to be a big brother. Meghan gave birth to their first son, Archie Harrison, in May of 2018. In November, she revealed she had suffered a miscarriage, writing of her heartbreak in the New York Times and describing an almost unbearable grief. After stepping back as working royals last year, the decision that I have made for my wife and I to step back is not one I made lightly. Harry and Meghan started a new life in California, signing multi-million dollar deals with Netflix and Spotify and swapping royal red carpets for Zoom calls. And everyone's and mental and emotional well-being. When they stepped away from the royal family, Harry and Meghan gave up their royal highness titles as well as any public funding. But Harry did not give up his place in the royal line of succession. In a statement, Buckingham Palace said Her Majesty the Queen and the entire family were delighted and wished them well. Their new baby will be eighth in line to the throne. Sarah Harmon, NBC News, London. Still ahead tonight, you're vaccinated, now what? We asked the experts how they plan to live once vaccinated. Does life go back to normal? For millions in the U.S., it is a challenge just to get vaccinated. But once you have both shots, the next question is, how should you change your behavior? Can you go back to normal? Our Dr. John Torres asked top experts how they plan to behave once vaccinated. The COVID-19 vaccine has long been touted as the key to returning to normal. But one question on everyone's mind. If you do get the vaccine, what can you do safely? We surveyed experts across the country on what they plan on doing post-vaccination. On travel, the answers were mixed. Will you get on an airplane? Not immediately. Yes, I will. Now that I've been vaccinated, if I had to travel, either for a family emergency or for work, I would. I would not travel for pleasure or leisure yet. The same for heading to a restaurant. Will you eat indoors? Yes, I would eat indoors because I'm so protected. And then I would mask to protect others during ordering. I do not plan to dine indoors until community rates are lower. Their hesitation? While your chance of getting sick when vaccinated is very low, you could still carry it. I don't want to catch the virus from a potentially infectious source and bring it home to my loved ones who haven't been vaccinated yet. What about hugging grandkids again if the grandparent has been vaccinated but the child hasn't? Some of our experts say no. We know the children can become infected. And if they're infected, they can spread the virus and they can do so without having many symptoms. But others say it should be okay. There is a very 
theoretical slight chance that a grandparent who's vaccinated could have still some virus in their nose and pass it on to the grandchild. It's not completely without risk, but the risk is very low. While they all say they would avoid mass gatherings indoors, like concerts and sporting events, they're split on small groups indoors. Would you gather with friends inside? I would gather only with vaccinated friends in, inside and have a dinner party. Nope. I will be happy to continue hosting uh, my backyard for small get-togethers. Even returning to the gym, some more cautious than others. Would you go to the gym? I would go to the gym indoors. In a few months. If it were partially open with social distancing and masking and good disinfection, probably. Something many are looking forward to, a haircut while masked. I would love to get a haircut. If you look at this, this, is, this hair was cut by my, my 11-year-old daughter. And one thing they all agree on. Will you stop wearing a mask? No. No. Absolutely not. I would not stop wearing a mask. If only all the answers were so simple, on the road back to normal. Dr. John Torres, NBC News. There's good news tonight on this Valentine's Day about finding love when you least expect it. Meeting that special someone can be tricky even in the best of times. In a pandemic, even harder, but not impossible. Even in a pandemic, love finds a way. Had kind of this immediate connection. There are fairy tale love stories. We've seen each other every day. Nancy and Herb met at work. When the pandemic hit, they started talking and dating over FaceTime. Within 10 days, he said, you know, I'd like to marry you. Seven weeks later, they were engaged, then a wedding, and a honeymoon down old Route 66. And now that you guys can look into each other's eyes uh, without a cell phone, uh, <laughs> what's the best part of this? Everything. The best is we're together. Yeah. <laughs> and we're alone. Yeah, we are. And it's real. <laughs> when Mike and Andrew met online, they lived in two different states. After hours chatting virtually, they flipped a coin, and she picked up her life and moved 500 miles to him. On day 65, we bought a property together. And if one of our kids did this, we'd probably be pretty upset with them. And here we are at our age, doing something that's really, really quite silly, but fun. Manuela was studying abroad in Spain. Ryan was at home in Pennsylvania when they met online. And then the travel ban went into place. We're here in the middle of a pandemic, like, you know, life is on pause. And I still managed to find somebody who I think is like, you know, everything I would have asked for in a partner. Griffin and Niall are both students at Michigan State, but because of COVID, their relationship began online and apart. I'm so happy that we are together in the same city now and not long distance because that was difficult, especially with COVID. And it wasn't just new love that flourished. Valerie and Michael divorced in 2016. We spent, you know, significant a couple of years away from each other. In 2020, the lockdowns brought them back together. We picked up where we left off. I do think that the pandemic made us appreciate what's under our nose. Cedric was set to propose to his girlfriend, Julia, in Jamaica. But then international travel was shut down. COVID really kind of changed everything. It brought us home and helped us to really just settle down and focus on family and each other. So he painted this mural for her and popped the question. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, you can't wait another day. What's the lesson here on, on love, even during difficult times? No matter how crazy the world is, you know, you know, we still have to find the things that we care about. And that's NBC Nightly News for this Valentine's Day Sunday. I'm Jose diaz Ballard. Thank you for the privilege of your time. Good night. Hey, NBC News viewers. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here. And click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.